The Sopranos is far more than a simple crime show. In the writing, creator David Chase and his diligent team planted complex roots deep into the terrain of the psychological, metaphysical, and perhaps even the paranormal. In my prior videos on the series, I've delved into the show's psychological depth by examining the many dreams of Tony Soprano, as well as his psychedelic experience. One of the typecast breaking threads that makes The Sopranos unique in its subgenre, and one that is seldom spoken of, is its occasional forays into the supernatural. These supernatural occurrences are few and far between, and they all seem to center around one particular character, one of the show's most beloved characters, Pauli Gaultieri. David Chase has a reputation for being very particular and thorough. There are very few, if any, scenes or details in the show that don't serve the overarching narrative. In this video, we will explore these strange supernatural occurrences and discover why they are relevant. Let's begin with Paulie's character. On the surface, he is the stereotypical wise guy. Embodying this role, literally, he's always cracking jokes. This is made for some of the show's most memorable moments, and is a primary reason why he's so cherished by the fans. The more we see of Paulie away from the crew, however, the more we see how his sense of humor is more of a defense mechanism than anything. He consistently presents a traditionally masculine front and meticulously grooms his image. But somewhat paradoxically, he's actually highly neurotic, lonely, greedy, sycophantic, superstitious, and even at times, insecure. In the season 6 episode, Remember When, Tony, frustrated with Paulie's incessant yapping to strangers and really to anyone who will listen, vents to Beansy, who tells him that he's really all that Paulie's got. You, the guys, and his image. We can see Paulie's neuroticism plainly with his obsessive cleanliness. However, we begin seeing his superstitious side in the season 2 episode, From Where to Eternity. In the episode, Christopher is in the hospital after being shot in the prior episode. He goes into cardiac arrest and is pronounced clinically dead for one minute. When he wakes up, he urgently calls for Tony and Polly and tells them about the vision of hell he had. Christopher's Inferno is an Irish pub called the Emerald Piper, where St. Patrick's Day is celebrated perpetually. There, his father Dickie resides, alongside two Roman soldiers, Brandon Fallone and Mikey Palmese. Christopher gives them a message for Mikey Palmese. Three o'clock. This is an event that Paulie deems paranormal. He's alone in that belief. The eerie significance he sees in it is outright dismissed by Tony and can objectively be written off as a morphine-induced dream. Still, through the episode, it eats away at Paulie. He's plagued by nightmares of being dragged to hell. His girlfriend insists he visits a psychic specializing in communicating with the dead. After some protests, Paulie relents and goes to the psychic for answers. The ensuing scene, one of the most unforgettable in the series in my opinion, marks the first time the audience is confronted with an event that appears genuinely, objectively paranormal. Many viewers tend to write this scene off labeling the medium as a charlatan relying on cold reading to deduce details from people's lives he couldn't possibly have known, passing it off as a sixth sense. When it comes to real life mediums, I would tend to agree, but not in this scene. Although mob ties could possibly be deduced from Paulie's appearance and mannerisms in this scene, it would frankly be a gross stereotype to make that assumption. It would be even more egregious to assume that Pauly was a seasoned murderer based solely on his appearance. Because of this and the references to Pauly's first hit and the poison ivy rash he suffered when whacking Mikey Palmese, I'm inclined to believe that the medium in this scene is legit. This raises the questions, why include the supernatural aspect in the show? What's the point? Spirituality is a theme that David Chase was majorly interested in from a young age and it plays a prominent role in this episode, namely in the practice of religion, specifically Catholicism, and the ever-present conflict between religion as strict doctrine and religion as lip service. We receive a significant clue to our questions in the very title of the episode, From Where to Eternity. This is a play on words, derived from the title of a notable novel and later film, from Here to Eternity, which itself is derived from a poem by Rudyard Kipling called Gentlemen Rankers. 
Both pieces are thematically rooted in a disillusionment with war, with the ideals of serving in war souring upon confronting the reality. With this deliberate title, Chase and the writers allude to the subtle yet burgeoning disillusionment with religious faith among the so-called faithful. The swapping out of here to where introduces a critical element of uncertainty of where exactly the characters of The Sopranos, including Pauly, stand regarding their connection to the divine. In an interview from a few years ago with the National Catholic Reporter, David Chase, who was brought up as a Baptist, said that the Catholicism of the Soprano characters, quote, was always interesting to me, and as a storyteller, I'm certainly interested in spirituality. He continued, My mother made a big facade of being religiously concerned, and father always considered himself an atheist, but they made me go to Sunday school, where I learned, among other things, that God doesn't like Catholics because they drink during church services. Chase here humorously references a contradiction between actual religious action and empty religious sentiment. This isn't meant to knock religious folk or imply a universal hypocrisy among them, but anyone who has been in or around any religion can easily identify people like this. They project a pious front, yet their actions tell a different tale. This is a contradiction embodied by Pauli in From Where to Eternity. If he were truly religious, he wouldn't have subjected himself to satanic black magic, as he calls it. He would have sprinted straight to the church for guidance, which he does only after being led further astray spiritually by the medium. Pauli accosts the priest when he visits him. 23 years of donations to your parish and this is what this guy sees hanging over me, he says. The priest scolds Pauli for seeing the psychic in the first place, telling him it's witchcraft, it's the devil, they're heretics and thieves and he should have come to the church with his spiritual issue in the first place. Pauli believes that his donations should have given him immunity from the ghosts of his past. In his view, the church left him unprotected and he cuts off the priest and the church. You're never going to see another dime from me, he says before walking out. This final scene reveals two things about Pauli. First, he believes firmly in the validity of the medium despite it being in direct conflict with the doctrines and the values of the church. Second, he views his relationship with religion as being purely transactional in the mafia context. Donating money to them isn't toward the end of being a devout believer or out of the goodness of his heart, but rather to be insured against his immoral deeds, like paying for indulgences in the age of Martin Luther. I have to credit David Chase and the writers once again for their mastery of irony here. To answer our questions from earlier, the significance of the supernatural occurrences in this episode is twofold. It provides subtle commentary on the oxymoronic nature of religious mafiosos and exposes the hypocrisy in Pauli's religious beliefs. He's only a Catholic, as long as the church serves him. The second supernatural occurrence I'm going to cover sees Pauli once again clashing with the church. It comes in the season six episode, The Ride. We see Pauli in even more dire financial and spiritual straits. We discover some intimate details concerning Pauli's private life in the few prior episodes. He found out that Nucci, the woman who raised him, wasn't his birth mother. His birth mother was his aunt, a nun who confessed this secret to him on her deathbed. She also reveals that his father was a World War II GI named Russ, who probably is Carmela's father's friend Russ Fagoli, the former diplomat with a PhD from Princeton, who was a World War II veteran and a survivor of prostate cancer. The confession weighed heavily on Pauli and caused him to cut off his mother. He considered it an unforgivable betrayal. In the ride, Pauli is responsible for organizing the Feast of St. Elzir, a neighborhood celebration commemorating the contribution of Italian Americans to the community. Pauli naturally sees this feast as a for-profit venture and is incensed when the new priest shakes him down for a larger slice of the pie. Unsurprisingly, he refuses to pay up and cuts corners on ride safety, leading to injuries. To make matters worse, he receives a prostate cancer scare, which he frets about obsessively. Tossing and turning one night, he crawls out of bed at 3 o'clock and frantically calls his doctor. He's not there, and Pauli's anxiety festers, leading him to the Bing and to the second paranormal event. 
Pauli's vision of the Virgin Mary. This scene has also been written off as a vision brought on by excessive worry and sleep deprivation. The key component that leads me to conclude that the vision is not a subjective hallucination is that we glimpse Mary in the mirror right before Pauli turns and sees her. Also, it's not exactly a very sudden vision. He stops for a few seconds right before, as if he felt a presence in the room with him. The significance of this event comes in Pauli's response to it. After some deep thought, he reconciles with his mother at the end of the episode. What's curious about this event is why exactly is it the Virgin Mary that appears to him? It's not meant to show a change in Pauli's religious attitude. It's a clever parallel to his own mother. She's a nun, which serves as a symbol of purity, yet just like Mary, she had a son. Why does this vision prompt a reconciliation with Nucci? After his birth mother passed away, Pauli cursed her and avoided going to her funeral. I believe the vision dredges up a great deal of guilt. This may be a reach, but knowing the emphasis the show places on music, I couldn't help but think of the first verse of the Beatles song, Let It Be, when I rewatched the scene. In Pauli's hour of darkness, Mother Mary literally stood right in front of him. She didn't speak any words of wisdom, but words didn't seem necessary. He got the point. He may not have had a chance to honor his birth mother, but he still had a chance to make amends with the woman who raised him as a mother and to do right by her. She was, after all, one of the only people in the show he was really close with. He finally comes to understand the pain he inflicted on her by cutting her off. It shows us that despite his flaws and evil deeds, Paulie maintains a shred of empathy. Or at the very least, he's not a complete sociopath. We get confirmation of this when Paulie expresses guilt over his turbulent relationship with Christopher following his death. Paulie keeps his vision of the Virgin Mary close to the chest, presumably only telling Pauly about it in the season finale, his final scene in the series. Just like with 3 o'clock, Tony dismisses it, turning it into a joke. This scene leads us to another aspect of the show that many people consider supernatural, the orange cat that hangs out at Satrials. There are a plethora of theories about the cat, the most prominent of which is that it's Christopher's reincarnation, or Christopher's ghost. The way the cat perpetually stares at Chris's picture triggers Paulie's superstitious tendencies. He lobbies to get rid of it, but is vetoed by Tony. I don't believe there's anything particularly supernatural about the cat. I see it as being a symbol of death. The most obvious reason is that it stares at the picture of that dead kid. More subtly, I think it's supported by the content of Paulie and Tony's final conversation. Tony wants Paulie to take over Ralphie's old crew. But despite it being a lucrative position, Pauly is surprisingly reluctant because all the past skippers of that crew wound up dead. In the end, Tony leverages Patsy to get Pauly to accept. After Tony walks away, the cat wanders into frame, lying down on the sidewalk next to Pauly, possibly signifying that Pauly had just signed his own death warrant. Tony's embrace of the cat could support the idea that he's killed after the infamous cut to black. Interestingly, when Tony walks into Holstein's in the finale, there's a large image of a tiger on the wall. There's one last event that I want to cover. It's a dream that Pauly has at the end of the episode, Remember When. It's not exactly a supernatural event, but one that is equally as strange and tells us much about Pauly's true character. In the dream, Pauly arrives home and hears a commotion in the kitchen. Expecting an intruder, he instead finds the ghost of Sal cooking. Pauly asks him, when my time comes, tell me, will I stand up? A clear parallel is drawn between the two gangsters in the episode, with Pauly nearly meeting his end by Tony's hand on a boat. This is a clever reference to the term stand-up guy. Right before Sal is killed in season 2, he's so nervous that he can no longer stand. His final words are a plea to Tony to sit down. In the end, he wasn't a stand-up guy, he was a rat. I interpret this rare peek into Pauly's subconscious as a manifestation of his anxiety over his image and insecurity over his position in the Soprano crew hierarchy. It could also be an indication of guilt for telling Johnny Sack about Ralphie's joke. What's certain is that the dream rattles Pauly. He knows how close he came to death and immediately sets himself towards self-preservation. 
In the following episode, he attempts to ingratiate himself with Tony, sending him a lavish espresso maker. All in all, despite his facade criminal habits and susceptibility to psychics, dream messages, and dirty toilet seats, Polly was a very human character, deserving of his image as a core Sopranos character. A credit to the writers and to Tony Sirico for animating him.